the means available for the defense could only be evaluated approximately on account of the confusion that reigned in a front that was constantly being broken and overrun. Whether because of the difficulties thrown up by the fighting or the interference of the parties and unions that had organized the militias, the columns were constantly being remade or reinforced in a most precipitate fashion, without the sanction of the high command. To make matters worse, the defender's proximity to the capital had greatly increased the confusion on account of the greater ease with which the political movements could manipulate those forces which they regarded as their own. Good morning to everybody, I'm Pep and this is the Spanish Civil War. In this channel and for the next three years, we'll follow week by week the Spanish Civil War, its battles and the Holocaust that it provoked. This week we've got an exhausted but full of morale rebel army that advances to reach the starting point for the final assault on Madrid, its most difficult test up to this moment. You see, in contrast with what happened with the Republic, the rebels had an army, or better put, they were an army. This had enormous advantages in organizative matters, and this had a translation in the field. But it had also a direct effect in the field of battle, as there was more discipline, also transmitted to their cowardice and phalanges militias. They had the ultimate habit of obeying orders when things got dire. Something that the loyalist militiamen lacked, and this translated into defenses or attacks that lacked cohesion too. The campaign of Extremadura and the march towards Madrid were carried in the old-fashioned way Spain fought in the Rip Wars, and with similar results, as the loyalist forces opposing them, like the right tribesmen, were not able to dispose an in-depth defense system, and where their line fell somewhere, they retreated, fearing an encirclement. But those columns that carried out this campaign and were now ready for the final assault on Madrid would perform poorly against any European army. An assault like the one at Badajoz, too costly for the rebels, would have ended in a disaster against any European army. Mostly because the Spanish army lacked the great war experience and the firepower other European armies had. According to Isdale, the five columns ready for the attack on Madrid, around 15,000 strong, were led by Asensio, Cabanellas, Castejón, Delgado, Barrón and Rolando de Tella, were composed mostly by seasoned Moors and legionarios, and would be supported by a company of Italian Alfred Tanquets, including a section of the flamethrower version, two Panzer I, one Bilbauer Mortcar, five three-gun batteries of 37mm Pac-36 anti-tank gun, three two-gun batteries of 65mm C65-17 M1913 infantry gun for AT purposes and one battery of 20mm Flak 30 anti-aircraft guns. Added to that, they had the following artillery batteries of 4 guns each, 5 batteries of 65mm M13, 5 batteries of 75mm Schneider M06 and as heavy artillery for the offensive, 4 batteries of 105mm Vickers M22, 4 batteries of 155 Schneider M1917. You see, Madrid was at that time a city with more than 1,200,000 souls, and probably reached 1 million and a half or even more due to the surge of refugees that fled from the rebel advances. Toledo, for example, the last huge city that fell in rebel hands, had around half a million inhabitants. The rebels may found themselves with some problems to take that huge city with the few artillery they have and with no reserves. Up to 50 planes, half of the rebel air force will be concentrated for the assault on Madrid. Mostly Fiat CR-32s, Ju 52s SM-81s and Romeo Ro 37s. Opposing them, we started our episode with the words of Vicente Rojo. Catholic officer loyal to the government that we saw trying to negotiate Alcázar's surrender weeks ago. 
a man that this week will start becoming a central character of the Republican War effort. Among the chaos and unreliable troops Rojo talked about, the Republic had up to 13,000 men to face the rebels and up to 10,000 more men in the reserve. Most of these reserve troops, according to Cardona, had no weapons and Rojo expected them to fight with the rifles of the dead or wounded. Among the ones that had the weapon, according to Rojo, they had 6.5, 7.0, 7.62 and 7.99 mm rifles, 5 different calibers of machine guns, 3 of mortars and 8 of artillery. Again, a logistical nightmare. And we will see during the battle how the Republican forces will be reusing cartridges resembled in artisan workshops. Even though the Loyalist forces could be counting also with 45 artillery pieces that will be almost the double by the end of the battle. They can also count also with two Renault F-17 tanks, about 80 T-26 and BA-3 armor carts, some improvised armor lorries and armored trains and more than 50 modern Russian planes. Among them, I-15s, I-16s and Tupolev's SB-2s. In fact, this week, the battle in the skies above the capital takes a new direction with the appearance of the first E-15s, to the point that the 6th, the nationalist commander of the Air Force in Madrid front, orders his squadrons not to engage unless they had clear air superiority. Since this week, nationalist air force will start switching its strategy to nighttime raids against the densely populated working class neighborhoods of the capital. But in the ground, the things were not getting better for the Republic. Another attack on the area of Ilexkas took place the second, but it was again a failure. By the 4th of November, the anarchists joined the government. For the first time in history, the anarchists were part of the government of a country. For the first time in Spain history, a woman, Federica Monsen, will become minister. Her own father will say that this could mean the death of anarchism. In fact, as said weeks ago, when the anarchists joined the Catalan government, it seemed the anarchist movement had no choice but to enter the government and fight the struggle with the other anti-fascist actors or fight alone against everybody. Not an easy choice, considering also what happened in Valencia last week and that the socialists kept most of the ministries. Those anarchists that just joined the government were opposed as the communists to the idea of abandoning the capital, but to no avail. As the 6th of November, covering themselves with shame, the members of the government fled the capital. Some of them were stopped by anarchist controls in the road towards Valencia, and the anarchists gave them passage only after a written authorization had arrived from the Central Committee in Madrid. Here we have another example of the few control the government had over the militias. Fleeing the besieged city before the imminent attack will become another stain into the government's prestige that will remain. And just before leaving the capital, General Miaja, the man that failed to take Cordoba, not fully trusted, and that was, maybe, a dispensable man, was appointed as commander of the city's defense, and General Pozas as commander of the army of the center. They were given an envelope and were ordered not to open it until next morning. Luckily, they disobeyed just to find out that, among the cows, they were given the other's orders. Miaja's task was to create a Junta de Defensa that would take charge of the city's defense, trying to delay the enemy as much as he could. Meanwhile, Pothas would try to encircle the rebels with counterattacks at their flanks. If the city fell, as everybody expected, Miaja would have to retreat, keeping his forces intact to the north. Miaja will appoint Vicente Rojo as his head of staff, and the Junta will be composed by representatives all the realities that were taking part in the fight. PSOE, Izquierda Unida, Unión Republicana, PCE, CNT, Unified Socialist World Youth, UGT, Partido Sindicalista and the Libertarian Youth. Even though it was clear from the beginning that the Socialists and Communists would be the ones with more power in the Junta. As the rebel artillery party starts to pound Republican defenses the down of the 7th of November, Two loyalist counterattacks to the rebels' flank. 
including the North attack near the Casa de Campo, Castejón is wounded, and the rebels find themselves in serious trouble to continue their advance. But the big prize of this counterattack comes at the south, where one of the L3 Italian tankettes supporting Della and Barron's columns is destroyed and the plan for the enemy offensive falls into loyalist hands. Now, with the enemy plan in hands that consisted in a diversionary attack towards Caravanchel and a main thrust coming from the east and crossing the Manzanares through the Casa de Campo, the yet unexperienced Rojo will apply his academic knowledge focusing the loyalist reserves at his right. On the 8th of November, the battle for the city of Madrid properly starts. The aids of all Spaniards centered on the capital as the rebel troops advanced, finding a first resistance. The screams and posters of No Pasaran echoing the Great War and the main. But this time, it seemed there won't be any miracle. Even though taxes will be taking troops to the front, and some of them will even use the metro to get there. But it seemed the Republican army could not withstand the rebel punch. But we will have to wait until next week to see what will happen. Even though the rebels are so sure of their victory, the Germans are not sure about the capabilities of the rebels to win the war. So by the 6th of November, the legend Condor starts to leave Germany. On 100 planes between bombers, fighters and reconnaissance planes, the Condor legend was supported also by anti-tank and anti-aircraft guns and eight tank companies in two different units. Creating the rebel armies meant that both Hitler and Mussolini needed their victory to recover their investment. Apart from this fundamental economic reason, both dictators wanted to project an image of prestige and force toward the world, an image that a rebel defeat would harm, as everybody already knew about their intervention. Going now to the rear guard, that is maybe not a rear guard anymore, We've talked last week about the evacuation plans for the rebel prisoners that were kept in Madrid. The 5th, after the fall of Getafe the day before, around 80 rebel soldiers from the prison of San Anton are murdered after they reaffirm that they abjured their oath to serve the Republic. The 6th, from three prisoner convoys that were meant to reach Alcalá, just two of them made it. The prisoners of the remaining convoys were murdered at Paracuellos. The sacas will increase as the rebel army gets closer to Madrid. The 7th, another saga took place at the prison of San Anton and at the Modelo prison. According to Preston, there will be more sacas the 8th, 9th, 18th, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th of November, 1st and 3rd of December. The rebel prisoners were supposed to reach the Republican rearguard, but instead, most of them were killed in Paracuellos and Torrejón de Ardo. Between 2,200 and 2,500 prisoners will be killed in what is known as the Massacre of Paracuellos, the biggest single massacre carried out by the Republic. And as behind it we could find new design authorities linked to the recently created Junta de Defensa de Madrid, it would be unreal not to consider this as the biggest institutionalized massacre of the civil war committed by the Republican side. The massacre of Paracuellos will become another stain on Republican credibility, a stain that will become a tool for the post-war regime justification of the coup and the Spanish civil war. It became a symbol of the Red Terror and for Franco supporters, even more. Before leaving you with the first shots of the Battle of Madrid and the massacre of Paracuellos, we'll end the week with a quote by Stephen Foucault about the morale in Madrid. It seems certainly that the capital was doomed. The sight of the demoralized retreating militia, the departure of the government from Madrid, the hurried escape of noted leftists, all combined to make the occasion opportune for the capture of the city by the advancing nationalist columns, the morale and spirit of which were very high as a result of an uninterrupted series of crushing blows they had inflicted upon the enemy. So folks, that's all for this week. Please don't forget to like the video and subscribe us. If you enjoyed it, share it. We have to bring light to the history of Spain. If you are able to support us in our Patreon channel, 
as these heroes already did, or offer us a coffee, this would also be great and would help us to carry on and improve the project. Let's make this possible all together. Thanks for your attention. Goodbye and salute.